So Kevin and Greg, you guys are working on a book on the mission of the church. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, we've been uh, we've been reading some some books about the mission of the church and, and thinking about some of the uh, uh, the writing about what it means to be missional. And so what we're going to be doing is uh, is looking at at uh, some theological points and exegetical points and uh, uh, thinking about how you uh, how you define if you can what the church is supposed to be doing. And and I think. You know, obviously missional is a big term, and some people hate the term, some people love the term. I mean, I, I don't get too uptight about the term, I just don't always know what people mean by it. And yeah. so we're, I mean, this just seems like a huge issue in the evangelical world to try to figure out what ought we to be doing as Christians, and is that identical to or different than what the church ought to be doing as an institution? Mm -hmm. And is that identical or different than what God's mission is? I mean, the, the missio day. what is God's mission and how are we a part of it? And, you know, not to sell the whole farm on what the book's about, because we haven't writ written it yet, yeah. we don't quite know, Very but I mean, process. but one, one of our, I think, maybe subtle critiques of some of the, the missional literature is that there's often a confusion between the promises of God and then the commands of God or the obligations of Christians. Yeah. So if God promises that one day the whole world will be renewed, does that in turn mean we are responsible for working toward yeah, that well, renewal? Or just a simple assumption that if <clears throat> if God cares about something or if God has promised to do something in the future, that therefore we are to be about that as Christians or the church. Mm -hmm. And that just seems to be, uh, to me anyway, uh, 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 not the case on some very simple things. So. For example, one of the promises that God makes to us in the book of Revelation is that when the end of time comes and he judges, he's going to kill the wicked. That's a promise. Uh, and yet we better not be about that in the present day. That's right. So you, have right. to, you just have That's to break right. apart what God has promised and, and what, therefore, are the imperatives for us. Yeah. Now, don't a lot of folks, <clears throat> instead of going to the future to talk about what the mission of the church is, they go backwards, right, to creation. Uh, so the creational mandate, what, what is that? Yeah. The, the cultural mandate? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, or creational mandate. Well, that's, the, that, that's what God gave to human beings in the garden in, in Genesis 1 and 2. And then after the fall, it gets, it gets sort of reestablished with, with Noah, who's another representative of mankind. So uh, a lot of what is often taken as, as mission of the church is, is simply God has, has given us this cultural mandate or creational mandate. And therefore, uh, because the church has redeemed humanity, uh, we are we are to be about uh, uh, fulfilling that cultural mandate. Well, in a sense, that's true, because those who are redeemed humans are in fact humans. But yeah. but one really important thing to keep in mind is that the the cultural mandate, as it's given to, to Noah and even to, to Adam, is not just incumbent upon the, the church. It's incumbent <coughs> upon every human being that lives. Uh, so so that's not what is unique. Uh, and uniquely Christian about what the church is supposed to be about. And, and don't you guys think that there hasn't been enough, you know, we're reading some of the stuff that David Van Drunen's working on, and so he's bringing mm -hmm. this up, but that there hasn't been enough interaction with the idea of, of the second Adam, mm -hmm. that Christ, Christ is the one fulfilling the cultural mandate, that Adam, I mean, he, he failed his charge in the garden, and he didn't pass the probationary test with the tree. And so Adam is the one who is now you know, the second Adam Christ who was doing what the first Adam didn't accomplish. And if you, if you get that, and that's why justification is actually very central to what is the mission of the church, that the, the kingdom then is a gift, the world that is to come is a gift because it's been secured by Christ. And I just think there's a lot of confusion. And some of it boils down to, there's a lot of stuff we just, we just know. I mean, sort of intuitively, we know being involved in the world is a good thing. Be, be in the world, not of the world. Mm -hmm. We know that helping the poor is a good thing. Do good to all people, Galatians 6, 10 says, especially the household of God. We know that part of the fruit of, of a transformed life is that we love our neighbors as ourselves. So to the degree that that's missional, you know, love people, love non-Christians, love everybody, mm -hmm. it's wonderful. What I think some of, you know, some of the rub, at least with, with me, is when you get the wrong categories in place, so a misunderstanding of what shalom is or, or how shalom is, is it given or is it created and what exactly is social justice. So there's a whole bunch of, I, I'm just thinking as we work on this, maybe some category confusions. Mm, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, you can get you can take a good thing, uh, which is which is certainly commanded of us in Scripture, uh, which is which is to do good deeds of of all kinds, love your neighbor, care for the poor, good things, and you can take those and, and get them wrapped up and twisted up around the wrong theological themes, gospel, kingdom, uh, shalom, like you mentioned, uh, and that's going to cause problems. And what what you have to do really carefully is is extract this good thing from the wrong theological themes and, and get it wrapped up around the right ones. Yeah. And, and doing that, the, the trouble is that doing that will often sound like you're, you're trying to, uh, to demote mm, good right. deeds mm, and, 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 right. make, and, and you'll, you'll, be, you'll be told by, by some that, well, you just don't think good deeds are important. Well, that, that's not the case at all. They, they are important. And, but, but simply to say that uh, it, it's not the case that, that if you say something isn't of the utmost importance, that therefore it's not important at all. So you want to take the good thing and click it into the right place theologically right. and not let it be clicked into the wrong place. So is the essence of mission proclamation? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. I, th okay. I think good deeds are, are incredibly important, <clears throat> but I think, I think clicked into the right place theologically uh, they are they are the fruit of the Christian life, and in some of the categories we're trying to work with, and we're still trying to figure out how, how do we describe this. You know, when some people say mission, they might just mean what does it look like to be a Christian? What does it mean to live an obedient life? And then you you open yourself up to all sorts of things. It, if you look at mission, and admittedly it's a non biblical word, so it's sort of hard to define. But if you look at mission, is what the church is sent into the world to accomplish. What it, what's our mission? What what are we launched out there to do. Boy, it just seems like the, the old traditional answer is the right answer, that the Great Commission yeah. to make disciples. And it sure seems from Paul's letters that that's what he's interested in. And in the book of Acts, interested in making disciples, which is different than just making decisions, yeah. but building up local churches, making disciples. And there seems to be very little interest, really no interest in transforming the whole world Hmm. or even launching out and trying to reclaim communities. Certainly, there's lots of good things that we could do and would fall under the banner of being salt and light. But it just it sure seems like from the New Testament, the thing that we are sent into the world to accomplish is to make worshipers who follow the Lord Jesus. Yeah, well, there's a reason that, that, that the <clears throat> Gospels uh, make their way in the narrative to those great commissions yeah. of what we're to do. And there's a reason that that uh, the book of Acts begins with that commission and then traces, as it says over and over again, the progress of the Word of God throughout the various uh, concentric circles that Jesus told them they were to, to go to. Now, Ryan, you're getting off without, with, you're asking us questions. <laughs> very, very humble of yeah, you. Nice job. But uh, you know a lot more about church history than we do. You've studied John Owen. John Owen is not like really quoted in a lot of missional sort of literature. <laughs> no, but I mean, all. do you have, what's, what's your understanding of, of the mission of the church, and is, is this a, a new kind of question? Is it total, was it totally different then with the such church-state overlap? Yeah, in, in a lot of ways it was. I mean, uh, Owen and his contemporaries wouldn't have been shy about the fact that they saw uh, church and state going together. Um, separation of church and state is an idea, I think, that comes a good bit after, even though that's often read back into that period. Um, that said, Owen was um, often referred to nowadays, thanks to Carl Truman, as a Renaissance man. Um, you know, he had a, a book on um, beer making. He had uh, books on art and um, and uh, different sociological studies at the time. He was kind of a cutting edge sort of guy mm. with an interest in um, the sciences. Anything about powdered wigs or? He was a fan, as you know. He was a fan of fashion. He was known for getting his. No, uh, I didn't Italian, know that he was. Yeah, he, he was known for. Was getting that an incarnational his... sort of ministry thing, like relating <laughs> to the incarnation to the court? <laughs> That's yeah. right. He was known for Italian boots that came up to his uh, mid thighs, uh, which isn't exactly a good thing to do in the mid 17th century <laughs> to be uh, encouraging imports from Italy. Uh, that's another another matter altogether. And, and so, what do you, uh, what does your church do with mission? I mean, you guys yeah. wrestled with this. You have a, a fairly big church in New Mexico. How do you guys approach the mission? And does missional stuff mm -hmm. resonate with your folks? Well, it's something uh, <clears throat> people are talking about, of course, on a younger generation, um, even more so. But I think we have to get. Uh, 
busy about the proclamation of God's word among uh, the people in, in their communities. And so that means, yes, being a good neighbor. Yes, mm -hmm. that means loving your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that means being diligent in your work. The Bible speaks to all these things, but at the end of the day, people aren't saved by your diligence mm -hmm. at work or your good behavior or your integrity mm -hmm. at the bank. Um, they have to be saved by the gospel of Jesus' yeah. death, burial, and resurrection. That's exactly right, and it's it, that's a that, that's a fantastic point because because one of the things that that can happen when we start defining sort of the entire Christian life as mission. <laughs> Yeah. is that people will do the things you're talking about, integrity at work, yeah. and they'll do paying their bills on time, and they'll do all of those things. Yeah. And they'll say that because they've done those things and those are mission, that therefore they've done what God requires of them. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and, right. and that's right. just not the case at all. Is it fair to say that it's missional in some ways is nothing more than a hip version of lifestyle evangelism that was really popular in the 70s? Well, if I say yes, <laughs> that will get us. I mean, it might be for some people. There's certainly, certainly, uh, you know, other practitioners who are would be more thoughtful about it. I think that you know the bottom line is we really want to remind, especially you know our generation, of the centrality of proclamation and disciple making in the mission of the church. That you can be doing all sorts of other things, trying to bless people, love people, but you're not fulfilling the one task that Christ gave his disciples before his ascension if we aren't making those new disciples, building them up, establishing them in local churches. Yeah, all right, I think we've got to wrap it up there. Thanks, guys.